Welcome to the 26th episode of The Crossroads, a weekly financial show for our generation. And for listeners, welcome back to the Long Game Podcast. This week, we're joined by Tyrone Ross. He's a crypto and digital asset advocate, an entrepreneur, and founder of Learn to Money. And we know you're a busy guy, and you've been storytelling on the internet for several years. So for anyone who wants to listen to more of Tyrone's story, we'll link to his social and some of the past interviews in the show notes. Um, but to kick us off, if you wouldn't mind giving the listeners just a quick intro into who you are and kind of like out of all the different industries, what led you to wanting to make an impact in the financial space? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you, gentlemen, for having me. i um, huge fan of what you all are doing and the way that you are doing it. Keep pushing down that path for sure. Um, so for those who don't know me, I'm Tyrone Ross, born and raised in New Jersey to superhero parents, uh, Carol Ross and Tyrone Ross Sr. Um, I am an advisor. Um, I was putting that, you know, that swore down for a bit and I'll be picking that up soon again. Um, been in the space as an advisor for the last seven years, uh, working with clients who've owned millions and millions of dollars of crypto years ago. Um, and got into the space around 2014 and 15 when I was at Merrill Lynch, um, one place at the time you did not want to talk about crypto. Um, and obviously, as folks know, I'm, I am an, an, an entrepreneur and, and just got done building a company, um, probably will continue to build in the space because I still feel like there's a lot of things that need to be built for the entire wealth management space to move into crypto assets with um, the infrastructure, the knowledge base and the tools that they need. So for me, getting into financial services was not something that I wanted to do or thought to do. Um, first in my family to finish high school, we didn't talk about money or stocks or bonds, any of that stuff. And we were joking before I came on. I, I was a probation officer before my first Wall Street job. I was a juvenile probation officer and I loved that job. I thought I was Will Smith, all right? Like I was running around the streets of Elizabeth, New Jersey <laughs> um, with the vest on and the whole thing. But um, in graduate school, I had a professor who mentioned Wall Street, and I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. And I was probably around the age as you are now. I was in my mid twenties. I'm like, I don't know what the hell Wall Street is. He's like, Yo, you'd be great on Wall Street. I'm like, Well, tell me what it is. And he did. And and that and and at that moment, um, I, I kind of was shown the way, if you will, right. And I had a lot to learn since then. So now, you know, you're talking that was '06. So, you know, uh, 16 years in now, um, and it's been a circuitous route that I started on the, you know, at an IRPR firm. So that's where I kind of learned the, the institutional side and, and writing press releases and learning, you know, the different sides of the market and then left there and then was cold calling my brains out, right? Um, 600, 700 dials a day at a, at a chop shop, Wolf of Wall Street style. Um, and then left there and then did the wirehouse thing. So that's kind of when I was introduced to really being an advisor and financial planning and all of that. And then left there and then ran my own RAA for a while with a, with a partner. And then after leaving that, um, started to work with the good folks over at Altruist, Jason Wank, and the folks at 2019 to do the Human Advisor podcast. Stay tuned. There might be some cool things coming there for folks who are a fan of the Human Advisor Pod. We're cooking that up again. So excited about that. Yeah, you go. Uh, I even see that. That's what's up. Uh, I need that shirt. Um, I gotta, I gotta t I'm texting Jason right after this. But and yeah, and, and and then you know, following around Jason and and kind of being his shadow kind of got into the oh okay right the startup space and all those things and then here I am today talking to you all yeah and I feel like for everybody who wants to go listen more in depth in season one we have a whole podcast on Tyrone's story um we start, start, started talking about Bitcoin a little bit in there too but today's topic what we're going to talk about is really like why there's a separation in our mind between Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. But before we get into there, like what made you really get involved in that space? Because you were the first advisor ever I ever knew or heard of that was like, I am like a digital or crypto advisor. What like I feel like so many people were pushing it away and saying, like, oh, this is a fad. This isn't going to turn into anything. Like we already have sound money. Like, why why would we ever need that? Like, what made you realize it? Cause you were on the forefront. Yeah, I, I was I was early. If you go back and look at some of them old tweets and how people are like, you're nuts. 
So it was, it was a few things. One, in 2015, right, I always tell people, you live two lives in crypto. One, when you heard about it, you go, oh, that's dumb. And then the second one, you go, oh, my God, I should have listened the first time, right? Mm -hmm. So when I finally came around, it was because a friend of mine had sent me some Bitcoin, right? For those of you who know what Bread Wallet is, he sent me some Bitcoin on Bread Wallet. And I was like, it just changed my life. Because if you grow up how I grew up, it's impossible not to understand Bitcoin. It's impossible. Right. And I was just like, teach me everything. Right. Like you, you only need to see your mother crying multiple times to trying to next check cash in place to get a check cash before you go. Oh, OK. Instant money in my hands. I get it. So I was in this Facebook group chat and I see a bunch of really smart people and they're talking about all this stuff I understand now. But they were giving each other some horrible investment advice. I'm like, oh, this is this is bad. And the light bulb went off. And I remember talking to my mentor at Merrill, and this was 2016 now. And I'm like, I'm going all in here. I'm like, this is the, and he's like, uh, okay, I don't know. I'm like, no, I think this is it. 2016 Labor Day, I met Howard Lindzen in New York City. And I remember I was watching college football at my parents' house and I tweeted him because he said he was coming to New York City. I'm like, you got 15 minutes for me? He's like, yeah. We sat for like an hour and a half and oh, did I go on and on about crypto and startups and crypto and startups. And he said, do yourself a favor. When you leave here, go learn everything you can about crypto and startups. You'll have such an insurmountable lead on advisors, they'll never catch you. And I took that seriously. And I just started to go all in. I learned everything I could. I was listening to, I mean, I was putting in the reps, right? And next thing I know, I never forget it. I'm like, I'm going to Whole Foods and I get a DM from Josh Brown. And I was like, you know, at the time I'm like, <gasps> right. It's like Jesus asked you to come to a barbecue if you're in the RA space. <laughs> so he literally DM me. He was like, we've been watching everything that you're putting on Twitter. Like you're the only one that makes sense of it and understand it. He was like, would you want to come out to our offices? I'm like, what? <laughs> you know what I mean? So went out to meet with him told him a little bit about what I was doing. I just saw how he was like, he just, he didn't get it, right? Because my business was, I couldn't custody. So I was like, you know, having to use all these different tools that didn't, you know, weren't compatible with the tools, the normal tools that advisors use. So using advice pay to get paid. I was doing hourly subscription and retainer business and using all these weird tools. So, Oh, somebody's gonna say something. I thought someone was gonna say something real quick. Oh, okay. Um, and then so after that happened, I realized like no one really was understanding what I was what I was doing. Talking to SEC attorneys, a bunch of folks, it really wasn't everyone's was like that. That sounds I don't know if it's illegal, but it sounds legal, but it's like you know. And then I was on stage a consensus, me, Josh Brown, Mark Cassidy, and Ari Paul. And I ripped the Bitcoin ETF and it went nuts right because i was just like i'm working with clients that own crypto we don't need an etf so again that had kind of been the thing over the last couple of years so for me it was a few things sandwiched together just realizing that this was going to change wealth management it was going to bring financial services closer to people that have never had it before and it was going to force i don't care how you feel about bitcoin or crypto it now forces people your generation, right, that have never cared about finance before to care about finance. It's the trigger. So now, all of a sudden, if Bitcoin doesn't do anything else, it shine this light in this dark corner where, oh, I care about monetary policy. I care about fiscal policy. I care about the history of money. I care about how money is printed, how much, like all these things folks never cared about before. So whether you like it or love it, it's not important. But you have to agree that if only half the country are invested in the stock market, which is also a Ponzi, it's a whole other story. But if half the country still isn't invested, you all have done a horrible job <laughs> of trying to ingratiate yourselves to the other half that is not even looking this way. Bitcoin kicked that door down. And here we are. So I knew based on my background as a black man growing up in an unbanked home, first high school graduate, but also being, you know, serving wealthy people getting wealthier, but also seeing that gap there. I'm like, hmm, there's a, I, there's a way for me to add value here. So I was kind of like, I'm going all, going all in and I, and I followed my truth and what I believe to be you know, the best way to exhibit my skills and talents and passions and also my story. And I feel like it worked out.
Yeah, I think that's interesting because I can't imagine what people were saying five years ago or six years ago. Because like yesterday, I had a tweet from a CPA who was like, hey, are you, if I worked with you, would you tell me I have to buy Bitcoin? Because you keep retweeting stuff about Bitcoin. Like, I would never want to work with you. And I'm like, okay, well, like, I don't force anybody to buy Bitcoin or anything else. But obviously, you you don't really get it. But second, what you talked about of, of kind of like the equal system, like in the bill last week that just came out, they directly said in there that this, the financial system we have right now is not equal and fair. Nope. It never was. It wasn't built to be, right? And I think that's what we need to understand. It was never built to be fair. It was built for the people who speak the language of money. Very few people in this country speak the language of money. The three of us do. We are elite. We are the privileged because we could change this conversation from crypto to SPACs to muni bonds to real estate. To, we, would, we wouldn't lose a step, right? Yeah. That's elite. There's a lot of people who aren't there. So it was never set up for those people. Then when you look at the fact we don't have a real-time payment system in this country, Japan has had it since the 70s, right? We're still using ACH. That was built in the 60s, right? When you look at 5% on top of the cost that there is to send remittances, right, overseas, still using wires and what wires cost. Like, this is just stuff that should be fixed, right? And if you see all of that, it's hard to look away. And that's where I think big B Bitcoin, little B Bitcoin needs to be distinct, again, from the crypto the, the, the entire crypto space, because people who say that to you, again, I've gone through that. So welcome. You've crossed over. I would never want to. All right. Well, you don't want to talk to me because <laughs> of something that I've retweeted. Godspeed. But um, there's there's a way to look at this where there's there's this digital divide in the country where folks who just don't understand how to bank themselves or transact digitally prior to crypto, right? My parents don't go to an ATM because they got to literally to this day, my mother still goes to get money orders. She goes into the bank. She doesn't use an ATM, which was the last time the financial services industry innovated, by the way, it was the ATM. <laughs> but also there's this digital divide that is compounded by lack of financial education. And then the absolute nuclear bomb on it all is that now you have this technology that is revolution, revolutionizing every asset, every industry, permeating all you know, societies all over the world, but there's this underclass that isn't, it's not accessible to them until they learn, oh, I need is a phone and an internet connection, and all of a sudden, I can send value, I can transact. That's never happened before. So I think when the SEC looks and sees 200 billion in DeFi, which is just lines of code, and they go, what have we been doing wrong, <laughs> right? So there's a, lot, there's a lot to that, but that only happens because Bitcoin was introduced into the world. And I think with that comes a, a host of things, which is why you know, we're all here and why we're excited about the future. Well, let's build on that. So if the current monetary system not not equal, not necessarily fair. Now we have people who refer to Bitcoin as sound money. And people talk about like, this is the system that's equal, it's fair. Like, why, why are people saying that? What does that really mean? So uh, there, here's the thing, the, the sound money part, I, I understand that, right? I, I get it, right? Where, you know, there's only you know, there's, there'll only ever be, right? When you get into that, and I'm not gonna go down that rabbit hole, right? Only 21 million and there's, you know, it's set in stone and the monetary policy and, right, of, of Bitcoin and, you know, being hard money and, you know, can't be inflated away, all those things. That's, that's true. The people who need Bitcoin don't care about that. That's an elitist point of view of looking at Bitcoin. I've never mentioned it as an inflation hedge because I don't think it is. I so never mentioned it as, huh? I was going to say, so that's more so the side of things where people are like, hey, I want to invest in Bitcoin to make money. You're trying yep. to talk about it from like, here's the use case for it that people that don't even think about that, here's yep. why they want Bitcoin. Right. And that's, the, there you go. So here's the thing. If I'm in the US, Bitcoin is terrible money. It's where your feet are. If you're in Guyana, where my uncle is, if you're in Nigeria, Argentina, all the El Salvador, all the places that you hear about, 
that's a better money option for them because every for one, every time you spend it here is taxable, right? And there's better options, frankly, here in the U.S. for money, right? Um, or to transact or, or a currency, if you will, which is the original sin of crypto. Shout to Matt Hogan, who said it was calling them cryptocurrencies, right? Which is why I say crypto assets. So it depends on where your feet are. So Bitcoin, is it sound money overall? Yeah, absolutely. Is it money here in the States? Not a good one. We have better options for that. But the folks that have been left out of the financial system, it's great money for them. Um, Isaiah Douglas, who, you know, I know you, you all know, he talks about, you know, and, and Morgan Richard and Pierre Richard and those folks talks about it as a savings mechanism. I can roll with that because folks are using it to save and dollar cost averaging and just here's something I could put money in. And so I, I, I kind of get that narrative as well. But to me, it's just simply the accessibility. Now, all of a sudden, people who have never had the ability to invest or park their dollars somewhere without these usurious type of fees now can do that on their phone in real time. And I can send some wherever in real time. And it's on this really strong base layer that has an uptime of 100%. Never been hacked. And as long as that runs, who cares about the price? As long as that continues to run, the big B blockchain, now you're providing financial access to billions of people that have never had it before. Mm -hmm. That to me is incredible. And I also think that means if you really start to go downstream here and look at the folks that are investing in Bitcoin and crypto, LGBTQIA, Black women, Black people overall, right? Almost 25% of the Hispanic population. What do all those people have in common? <laughs> right? That, what do they all have in common? These are people that have felt like they've been left out, discriminated against, the traditional financial services system looks the same. Doesn't look like any of those people that I mentioned. So now my phone and the Bitcoin blockchain doesn't care if I'm gay, doesn't care if I'm straight or I'm trans or I'm black or I'm white or I'm homosexual. None of, none of those things matter. It's just, I can send value in real time, like right now on my phone. I can save on my phone. I can borrow, I can lend, I can do all these things right here, right now, and don't have to worry about being judged walking into a bank or have to worry about um, it taking forever and then the cost to maintain these things. So there's so much about it that I think gets lost on Twitter and all these other things where the narratives are just wrong. I think these are the right narratives of when you start to talk about financial inclusion, and that was in the executive order, but they need to say what financial inclusion <laughs> is to them. Someone needs to force the government to do that. I will. But what do you mean by financial inclusion? What do you mean by investor protection? And I said this when I spoke to the SEC Investment Advisory Committee. I said, you want to protect investors, meaning the people who have all the, you know, all of the, the um, education and wherewithal based on the rules that you set, but define investor, right? You're not thinking about the folks that are buying the meme stocks or whatever. That's not who you're talking about here. You're talking about the people who have it, who could afford a 20, 30, 40% drawdown. You know what I'm saying? So we need to draw a broader scope here around these definitions, but not forget if you're talking about income inequality and equity, if you're talking about financial inclusion, if you're talking about financial education, the digital divide, all of these things, it is impossible not to start with Bitcoin in those conversations and make any sense because it's making all of that you know, have to be at the forefront of these conversations and the dialogue that we're having now. Yeah, and I think you made a great, I mean, a lot of great points, but something you hit on earlier with the um, Bitcoin ETF was that like people who are already investing it, they don't need the ETF because you can just go out and buy Bitcoin. And I think that's like a lot of people are just getting their crypto information from headlines and news stories and just things that they see on social media. And those places definitely aren't always painting the most accurate picture. But like when people just like look at the price of Bitcoin or see a Bitcoin ETF, it's like, 
oh, it's just gambling. We're just betting on the price of it. But it's like those products are removing the entire purpose of Bitcoin at its core. Like mm-hmm. when you're buying the ETF, you're not actually owning that Bitcoin. You don't have custody of it. Um, so I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on like the importance of self-custody and like whenever someone hears like not your keys, not your coins, like why that should actually matter to them. Yeah, absolutely. I think, again, that, that's also a very prickly issue because I believe in self-custody and what that means to actually hold. It's a bearer asset, right, to actually hold it. And then once I hold it, there's all these really cool things I can do with it. I think you both would agree with me, though. We're very early with that because not easy. Yeah, not my keys, not my cheese. But, you know, if I lose my my seed phrase or, you know, I, I any of this stuff, my, my public key, my private key, my password to my Coinbase account. Right. There's so many different ways to get caught up here. So I feel like it's still ways to make that easier for yeah. folks to get on. And but that's where ETF comes into play a little bit for exactly. people who, are, who still want access but are scared of that side of it. Like I do get that, but it is like still kind of missing the point. But yeah, no, well, folks who said that, and I've been dealing with that years ago. That's a lazy argument because again, Coinbase solved that. Because if I buy crypto at Coinbase, it's they okay. take care of that. I still don't need an ETF for that. So, and not saying that was your argument, but I've heard that for years. I'm like, that's lazy. That's not why we need an ETF so retail can stop. We need an ETF because advisors want an easy way to wrap it in accounts, charge 1% and go play golf. Let's tell the truth, right? And then they can slide the fact sheet across the desk and say, Mr. Mrs. Client, oh, we've been studying Bitcoin and all of a sudden we have a solution. Here it is. We're going to do. That's what they want. It's an easy button, right? And the entire asset management space will make a ton of money when we get a spot, Bitcoin ETF, right? You just see what happened with BITO. The trading with nuts, right? I think the first day there was nine, what was it? 900 something. I think um, 900 million was like only 400 million settled. It's crazy. So people were just trading their brains out. Like it was, it's insane. So I think an ETF has its place, right? If you're talking about infrastructure and liquidity and all those things, right? Just very liquid markets, good price discovery. Okay, great. But again, for who? But the, the, the self-custody part of it, Right. Trading to your point is now once I understand self-custody and I walk through that in the safe, now I realize it's just like walking up and handing trading five dollars. Here you go. And I walk away. Don't need to know me. I just handed you money. I walked away. That's the picture I try and paint to people. That's what Bitcoin does. But it's digital where if there's a stranger. I just go like sometimes when I'm, you know, um, I have a rental car, I valet it or whatever. I asked her, like, you got cash app or whatever? Like, let me send you some Bitcoin because it's like me tipping you. But I could just send it to your phone, right? Like, that's the picture I try and paint for people. It just gives you the ability to walk up and hand somebody something like you would $5. They don't need to know you. You don't need to know them. I don't need to know your background, your age, social security number, this, that, whatever. I handed you five. I handed you value and I walked off. You don't need to know anything about me. That's what that's what Bitcoin brings into the world. And ETF doesn't do that. I can't hand the the, the Uber driver a Bitcoin ETF. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, so it's those things with that gets lost in the Bitcoin ETF conversation. I love Matt Hogan. We've been on, been on many of stage debating this. I think a Bitcoin ETF is a joke. We'll get one for sure, but it doesn't serve the true purpose of 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 crypto assets and Bitcoin, which is accessibility to people that have never had it before. And ETF doesn't help those people. But, you know, Wall Street loves money. Well, let's talk about, you said this early on that like in the US, Bitcoin isn't really like good money. Like we have better currency to use. Let's talk about why that is. Because, and let's talk about this last week or whatever, there was the bill proposed that if you transact in Bitcoin under $600, it's no longer, you no longer have to pay tax on the gain. Do you think that moves it even a little bit to become better currency? Is that one of the big arguments or in your mind, what are the big arguments? Yes, that is one of the things. Now, if that happens, right, under $600, not taxable. Now we're talking, right? I'm still not spending mine, but I get it, right? Like there's, that is a step forward. And that's why now, yeah, here, why would I do that? Like, why would I spend my Bitcoin for a cup of coffee at Starbucks or whatever? Like everyone remember backed, right? Remember when they made that announcement that they were going to do this whole thing that you can spend your back has been quiet. Like there's nothing happening there because that was never something that was going to happen until the rules changed, right? And the laws changed. So that would be a a big step. 
that's that's one reason why it's not good money here. The other thing is one of the things that you you two know, again, that I know, the traditional financial system was set up where once you're in it, we make it hard for you to get out of it, right? So if I'm using PayPal or Cash App, or if my direct deposit is set to go into this account, right? The average time that someone has a bank account is 16 years. That's longer than the average marriage in the United States. So once I'm tied to a financial institution, it's hard for me to leave. Hello, wirehouse advisors, right? <laughs> you know, so it's hard. They make it sticky and hard for you to get out, right? Uh, 401k rollovers, anybody, right? Like, oh my God, why is that? So, so they make, it's purposely obtuse and difficult to get things done in the legacy financial system. So that's the second thing is, so there's just, at some point you just go, ah, it's much better options than, than use crypto. I, I'm just going to use my dollars, right? I'm just going to, now crypto dollars and, and stable coins and all this, right? We have options now that make it really cool to get out away from using Bitcoin. But again, crypto dollars are just digital dollars, right? So you're just kind of going back there. So that's the second reason why. And I think the last reason why is what we were talking about earlier is just the education part. I don't have to educate somebody of putting 10 singles in their hand and saying, go, right? They know what to do because if you've just were raised with, oh, this is cash, this is money. But now if I go into an area like the South Bronx, if I go into, you know, Detroit, if I go into Gary, Indiana, if I go into Camden, New Jersey, now I have to teach these people about digital money overall and banking themselves and download Cash App, download Venmo, use Zelle, right? Like, it's crazy. When I, now it's funny. My, I taught my mother about Cash App and she only really likes it now because when you send it, like it gets like the coins falling. She loves, she loves <laughs> hearing that, right? But I had to go through this whole process of educating her on, no, you could just, you don't need to go into the bank. You don't need to do. So that's the biggest step here. Of, of those three that I've mentioned, where there are millions of people that just aren't going to be comfortable with this. And we have to get to those people, wrap our arms around them, educate them and get them to understand that this is a more efficient way. I compound that by saying this, when all that stimulus was announced during COVID, folks were actually getting their um, debit cards and, and, and these cards from the government in the mail with their stimulus and were throwing them out because they didn't know what it was. They never gotten mail from the treasury or anything like that. And then there are people who also didn't get it because they had never set up any type of direct deposit or had any type of account for the money to go into. So now I'm waiting on a check from the government. Good luck with that, <laughs> right? So everything that I'm saying is an infrastructure issue, which is again, not set up for those people. So by the time you get to all that, you go, all right, just cash. Just cash. Keep me away from the crypto stuff. Yeah. So that's why it's just, it's not the best money here. I think it's interesting too, to have the whole debate on Bitcoin of like, okay, maybe it's not perfect money yet, especially like number of transactions per second, like cat taxes when you sell all those things. But then there's the other side of it of like, who really that owns Bitcoin is, I guess the situation where you're talking about of people with instant money, like the, un, I guess you don't say unbanked, but the yeah. Well, what's, what's the the underserved, underserved, underserved. Yeah. like those are the people who would truly use Bitcoin right now. Most of the other people that have Bitcoin, the last thing they want to do is move it. I mean, if you look at the statistics, it's right like, you know, 40 to 60% of all of Bitcoin hasn't moved in three yep. years or something. Mm -hmm. So I think it's interesting that we have this whole debate of like, yes, it's sound money. You, we want it to be sound money in the future, but nobody also wants to spend it at all either. I think yep. that's the whole interesting part of it too. Yeah, absolutely. Like I, I joke with, with Justin all the time and a bunch of folks are like, oh, Tyrone, NFTs and all. I'm like, you're not getting my ETH. Like I'm not spending my ETH for this stuff, right? Like, so it has just, just me, but those of us that have been in this space for a while understand the benefits of the accumulation. Now I'll stake, hell yeah, I'm staking it, but yeah. I'm not going to buy some little ugly dolphin with a hat on. Like I'm not <laughs> going to do that, right? So you know, there and there's levels to it and the, the space will mature and then there'll be very convenient ways for me to do that. And again, 
as we sit here right now, I just tweeted before we came on MetaMask. Now has 30 million, right? Monthly active users. Damn. Yeah. Insanity, right? 30 million, right? Non-custodial future. But anyway, it's a whole nother podcast. But my whole point in bringing that up is that then makes it easier for people to part with their crypto when it's just, oh, click, 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 yeah. done, yeah. right? And that's that's the part of it that's very compelling and needs to be built out still. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. Now you bring up ETH. So what what in your mind, how do you view, view Bitcoin in different or Bitcoin and Ethereum differently? Like what, how do you, because I think some people just think of like crypto as one thing, but I feel like a lot of the people that are deep in the weeds kind of think Bitcoin and then there's like cryptocurrencies, which you, you call crypto assets, but like where right. what are the big differences there? The best way I could explain it is think of um, Bitcoin as like you have everyone you go in the house, like they have one good knife that they use to cut anything, right? Like cut rope, cut a watermelon, cut anything, right? Just that one knife. You just know I'm going to get that knife to defend myself, to cut something or whatever. Like I'm using it for everything. Everyone has that in their house. Ethereum is like that when you when you first get your first apartment and people come over and they give you like the 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 forks and the knives and the spoons the whole I mean like you got a bunch there to do different things they're not necessarily the best but they're multi purpose right oh two different size spoons two different size forks two different right and that's what Ethereum is it's very much multifaceted interoperable right the composability of it. It, it looked at what, obviously, where Bitcoin had its limits and said, oh, okay, we can do this, right? Now, both being settlement layers, right? And I've, I've tweeted this, I said this before. I think there'll be both settlement layers and then the transactions will happen on L2s or side chains and things like that. So I think when you look at what I feel they have in common is, again, just that base layer of settlement of things and then, you know, ETH has shown the ability where, you know, with the gas fees and all these, you know, digital oil folks like to call it, right? Because the ETH is almost like your, it's like an easy pass, right? Down the ETH highway, right? And get on and off um, to pay for things and get to the next de destination, right? Where Bitcoin is just that main road that you know is, I can take this to anybody's house in my town. I just need to get on Bitcoin and it's going to take me there, right? So, I think that's where I look at them them differently. And I do think because of Bitcoin, you got Ethereum. And now because of Ethereum, you have DeFi. And now because of DeFi, you have Sovereign, right? Sovereign now is DeFi with Bitcoin. Fascinating to me, right? Mm -hmm. When you look at what Sovereign is doing, S-O-V-Y-R-N, I encourage folks to look that up. Now, again, what's old is new again. Life is a circle. It all comes back to Bitcoin in the end anyway. So I think it just allowed developers and engineers to see the possibility of what's, what can happen here. But ETH is, again, that composability um, of to build whatever it is, whether it's NFTs, whether it's ICOs, whether it's you know uh, staking and yield farming and all these different types of games and everything, ETH is just all encompassing with all of this. It's like air traffic control for crypto. So it's pretty neat. I don't know if this is the right way to look at it, but in my mind, like when I look across the space, it doesn't really seem like there's like a true competitor to what Bitcoin's trying to do. But mm -hmm. I feel like more so on the Ethereum side, a lot of them are competing on very similar things. So obviously not investment advice, but it just, the, that's the way that I, I view them differently. Can they both exist and both be great? Yeah, for yeah. sure but they have completely different use cases and there's Solana and other ones that are trying to be mm -hmm. like, it can be kind of Ethereum, but a little different, but mm -hmm. Bitcoin's really far along and nobody's trying to be like, how are we the, you know, the right rules of money similar to that. Yep. Absolutely. And again, as you start to like, I think polka dot is fascinating. Right. And you don't really hear that, but you hear Solana and po polygons are too, but polka dot is really interesting. Now, again, look no further than Gavin Wood. But Polkadot is really interesting to me. Um, Decred still is very interesting to me. Like you look at Bitcoin and you start to read about Decred. So again, will any of these be 
Ethereum or Bitcoin? No, but I think you said it right. Like Bitcoin is Bitcoin. It's just there, right? And everything that people beat it up for, it's supposed to be that. Like that's a feature, not a bug. It just sits there. It's just like, oh, this is just, okay, 950,000, right? Daily active users, right? Just every day, right? 950,000 people on average just using it, right? It's just there. Like that's powerful. Um, and the settlements, of you know of being a true settlement layer of all of that information and data is incredibly powerful and interesting right like it's it's intellectually interesting right um and and powerful and then ethereum is is in its own way as well with smart contracts right smart right contracts and the ability to program things that now we take for granted like estate planning in our business at some point, it'll be written in a smart contract that little Johnny is going to get $5,000 every birthday for the next 20 years to this wallet at 459 Eastern time, right? Like, and it's going to start out as being paid out in Terra. And then over the year five, it'll move to being paid out in USDC, right? Like that's going to happen. And it's just going to be set. So that's the beauty of Ethereum, which you can't, you know, necessarily do on on bitcoin but you'll be able to do that soon as you know root stock and all these other things start to take hold yeah two last questions i have for you i'm not trying to take up too much of your time of course um one of them being that like i think an argument a lot of people have about cryptocurrency bitcoin ethereum is like they think that because it's called cryptocurrency there can only be one true one that exists in the future and yep. i just want to know what you, like how you respond to that argument um but this way, again, it, it's just a bad name to call them cryptocurrencies, right? That's one. And in the other part, I go, well, how many currencies do we have right now, right? There's multiple currencies in the world and multiple ways to, to transact, but there's one reserve currency, which is the US dollar, right? So I don't think that's a bad thing. And, 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 you know, it is a legitimate criticism understood, but someone who says that to me doesn't really understand the space. And then there needs to be some clarity that, well, yeah, if you say the cryptocurrency space, of course, you're going to get into no intrinsic value. And we get that. We know, <laughs> right. We know, we know. Right. So I think if you clear that up, it'll be easy for folks to say, oh, okay, right now you introduce them to stable coins or crypto dollars. Then you say, okay, well, this is what ETH does where it kind of act like that. And Bitcoin sole purpose, right, was this, right? And then it kind of clears that up. But legitimate, legitimate criticism. Yeah. And then last question, I'm just taking these words directly out of people I talk to. But yeah. the other question they have is like, I, I educate them on Bitcoin. You know, you can go read the paper, like understand it pretty simple. And they come back and they're like, okay, I get it. But like, how am I supposed to trust that the rules don't change? I think that's a bit like it says finite. Well, what if that changes? Like people just go down the, I don't want to trust in something. So I think that somehow this is going to be changed for the worse in the future and screw me. Um, that's where you go you know, it's very much digital religion, right? You just have to believe that it's going to happen, right? And there's a belief system here where everyone believes that every two weeks, if I'm working to come, I'm going to get paid. I have belief that if this, this says $5, that the cashier on the other side says it's $5. And I'm not going to walk into the store one day with a five and they go, no, those is three and a half, right? But so there, there's this inherent belief in the system in monetary policy that we just grown up with. This is the same thing here. So there is a belief that this is just written in code. No one is ever going to change it again. That's why Bitcoin being Lindy is so important. The longer it survives, the longer it goes, you just go, all right, yeah, this is real. So again, anyone that has those arguments, legitimacy, right, only comes after skepticism. So people should keep poking at it. Because the longer it lives and survives, you just go, see, right? High, high inflation, see, low inflation, see, high rate, see, low rate, see, like you just, it has to survive these environments. But I just think that it is digital religion in the, in the same way that I trust that if I go to the store, my $10 will always be $10. That's never going to change. But can the government change it to $9.75 on my bill? Yeah, they good. They're the government. So there's there's this belief system that has to come with money and that's all it is it's money is a belief it's 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 language any type of money is the same way bitcoin is no different um so 
you know, that's that's the main thing that I would say. I think that's where you just get folks to look at what they have belief in now and say, why is this different? Because you can't actually hold the physical Bitcoin. That's crazy. Yeah. No, I think that's super helpful. I I feel like I'm going to be pushing this to a lot of my clients and people I know that um, have had these same questions. So thanks for answering them and addressing them. And thank you again for giving us the time and hopping on the podcast today, Tyrone. We're going to have you back on again sometime soon as we get to hear about whatever your new project is. Be told yeah. We're going to be supporting and promoting whatever it is you're doing. So thanks everybody for listening. Please again, rate, subscribe, and share this with a friend if you found it as helpful.